Hi, good afternoon. Uh, welcome on behalf of City Arts and Lectures. I'm Isabel Duffy and I'm delighted to welcome our guest today, Yotam Otolenghi, who is joining us from London. Um, he's in his test kitchen. He's going to do a little demo for us and we'll be having a chat about his new book, uh, which I have here. Uh, flavor. <laughs> there we go. There you go. You can see that. Um, so welcome to our YouTube viewers. We will be taking questions from the audience. So if you want to submit your questions, look at that typing uh, on YouTube, we will um, come to those in a little bit. Welcome, Yotam. Hi, Isabel. How are you? I'm very well. I wish I was in London. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, all, all, the whole world looks pretty similar. We're all wearing masks. It's all looking pretty dreary. So you're, you should be happy where you are. <laughs> it's, not, it's not too bad. Um, so look, I have, I have, we're here to talk about this a new book, Flavor, but because I'm bilingual, I have this one too. <laughs> so that's the, uh, so you should. the English so you should. and the um, American versions. Um, tell us about how it came about. Uh, so flavor, uh, and I'm going to do that as I as I cook, if you don't mind. Please do. Um, yeah. So I, I'll just so I'll tell you about flavor at once. I've said I'll just explain what I've done. So in this pan, which you, I don't know if you can see that, I've got some oil, and I've added sliced garlic and sliced chili and a couple of star anise, and I'm making a dish from flavor, which is a celeriac dish or celery root, as they call it in America. And um, there's, I'll tell you more about the celery root as, as we speak on, but I'm just, I just wanted to update you what, what's going on here. Um, so the book is my third uh, book, which uh, in this ser series of Plenty and Plenty More. And it's the latest innovation in the world of vegetables in the world of Otolenghi. So, you know, it's all, uh, I love vegetables and I've been, I haven't been uh, shy about it for a very long time. And, uh, over the last four years, uh, or nearly five years since Plenty More was published, there's so many more ideas that have come through, particularly from my co-author, uh, Easter Belfridge, who's written this book with me and created so many of the recipes. It just feels a little bit different. It's like Ottolenghi with Mexican flavors and Brazilian and a bit of Italy, where Easter spent much of her childhood. So. It's really, it's all the, the latest and greatest from, from what we've been doing over here in this test kitchen in, in Camden, in North London, uh, which you know so well um, in this book. That's wonderful. So, so tell us again what you're going to be cooking for us and then we can talk a bit more about the book. Yeah, so I'm gonna cook this dish and I'll show you it in the book. It's a celeriac or celery root with a sweet chili dressing. Uh, I don't know if you can see the page, but anyway, it's gonna look even better when I, once I've made it. And there's four recipes, in, three recipes in the book that use uh, the celery root. And I love celery roots. Um, and I, the, both all three recipes uh, rely on the same technique of telling, taking the whole celery, celeriac, we call it, or celery root, and cooking it for about three hours with olive oil and salt. That's all in the oven mm -hmm. until it really caramelizes all the starches turn into wonderful sugars. And uh, that is your basic ingredient. And I've got it here. Uh, once it's come out of the oven, whole, I cut it into wedges, like the ones I've got here, and then give it a quick extra roast for another 20 minutes. And I don't know if you can see the color kind of tells it all. It's brown and caramelized and beautiful. Uh, so that's the dish that I'm making. One of the three dishes that uses the whole um, celery root in, in such a particular way. And uh, I cooked over the weekend, I cooked the kohlrabi dish with um, barley and that was another oh, really yeah. good use of the, those, those kind of sturdy root vegetables that can, you've, you've transformed them in, these, in the book, I think. Yeah. So one of those things that I, people ask is, so what's the latest in the Ottolenghi uh, pantry? And I say, actually in this book and, and actually quite a few of the recipes in this book and more recently in other publications, it's actually the good old familiar vegetables that are getting this special treatment. So there's recipes for Swedes and turnips and kohlrabis and cauliflowers and, and celery roots and potatoes. Those things that people, people think are so familiar, what else could be done with them? Uh, those are the ones that Easter and I have really been enjoying cooking with. And if you hear a noise, <laughs> that's the train. <laughs> so I'm just under a train arch. So those trains are going to come and 
spoil our fun once in a while, but, <laughs> but not really. So you're taking the much maligned vegetables and reinventing them, giving them a new life. Yeah, but you know, I don't know if you know, but you know, I've seen, I don't know if you've seen the... Oh. oh, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Oh yeah, there was a little bit of uh, uh, interruption there. I don't know if you've seen the, you know, the, the Brussels sprout renaissance that has happened recently. And uh, it's been incredible uh, how popular Brussels sprouts have become all of a sudden from some, something that people really didn't like to some, something that people really enjoy uh, at the moment. And I think it's just about shedding a new light on an old ingredient. And, you know, obviously boiling the Brussels sprouts, a Brussels sprout to death is like the worst thing you can do. And I don't know, you grew up in Britain, so you know what that's like. I didn't grow up here, but I've tasted a few of those. Uh, roasting a Brussels sprout is a completely different uh, story. And that's it. A lot of those things happen in this book where you roast vegetables and give them a whole different angle rather than boil them and then adding all sorts of interesting aromatics. Tell, talk us through what you're doing right now. Okay, so I've got the chili and the garlic here and I'm just going to give them a couple of more minutes. They need about three or four minutes to crispen up. Uh, I'm just going to ask Steph, do you want to check the recording on? Ah, it's all recording. Okay. Uh, no, because I've had a, we, we were, we're recording this for the radio and I thought this stopped working, but I don't, I think it's all fine. Uh, so what I'm doing now is a, is a technique that we use a lot in the book where we take oil and cook what I call aromatics, you know, garlic and ginger and chili and some spices like star anise. You can put cinnamon in. Uh, you can put uh, lime leaves or curry leaves or mustard seeds, you know, all those things that give um, food its, its flavor. We put it uh, inside the oil and we infuse it with flavor. That's the first step in so many of the recipes in the book. And what happens is we do two things at the same time. We create oil that cooks with those particular flavors. And we also, um, we also at the same time, uh, create some a crunchy topping. Mm -hmm. So those things that have just infused that oil with all those flavors are going to be a crunchy topping and it's going to look beautiful and fresh on top of the dish. So this is a technique that we use a few times uh, throughout, throughout the book and I just love it because it's such, such a clever thing to do uh, and such a useful thing to do because you, you know there's no reason to throw things out uh, when they, you know, once they've done their job, you really want to use them as much as possible. So now I'm going to drain the garlic and the chili and the star anise and, and just turn that off. And I've got those crispy bits and I've got a bit of oil. And that oil will, not all of it, but some of it will go into this dressing, which has got soy sauce, rice vinegar, lime juice, and um, I'm just throwing it in there. That's our dressing. That's our and maple syrup. So it's a kind of a sweet. We call it a sweet, a sweet chili dressing. And oh, was that? Mixing, that is the dressing. That's all. That's it. Yeah. And I'm just going to put it all together nicely now, and then I'll be able to sit down and talk to you a bit more peacefully. So I'm going to uh, to the dressing. I'm also going to add some chives and some black and white sesame seeds. And the one thing that I forgot to mention completely, which is extremely important is here, and that's something that I did. So this has two types of celery, celeriac. It's got the roasted ones that we just talked about, but it's got also these raw celeriacs and celery stalks that have been pickling for about an hour in lime juice and rice vinegar. And they've kind of softened a bit and they've turned crunchy and slightly pickled. Also, there's garlic there as well. So the dish comprises of two ways of cooking the celeriac. One of them is the roasting. And I'm just going to throw all these, uh, put these on the, on the platter and the pickling. So the pickles will go on top of the roasted celeriac. So you get two textures, two colors, two kind of uh, experiences in one dish. So I'm spreading them nicely over my dish and I'm going to mix that up and I'm going to just uh, spoon that sweet chili dressing over the roots and it's I love the way it kind of covers the plate 
uh, that's the, the, you know, you look at the colors and how much of that can you actually see? We, we can see it all. And it's actually making me quite ah, hungry. Brilliant. <laughs> I guess that's the, per that's the, that's the point, isn't it? Um, so all that beautiful soy and maple and vinegar is here. And I'm going to take those pickles and arrange them around the, the cooked celeria. I might not use all of it. And those pickles are just fantastic. They can keep in the fridge for a couple of days. And go over your cheese sandwiches. And I'm going to sprinkle, put some freshly uh, sliced spring onion here as well. And then all those beautifully crunchy chili and garlic. The star anise I'm going to put there just for to look at. You don't eat it, but you can take it off. And I'm going to just finish that off with um, some Thai basil, but you can also use normal basil. It all goes on top here. And that's it, really. I'm going to kind of show it to you so you get a better idea. And is this a kind of a typical Ottolenghi platter that you can find in our cafes in Delhi. So it's got all those textures and colors and I'm going to try to be really careful not to get the juices to come on because I really want to show it, but it's the camera thing. Can you see? Yeah, we can see. It looks amazing. Brilliant. Thank and, you. Uh, would that be a, uh, you, would you serve that as a side dish with other things or is that a main for two people? Love to, I love to create, so this would be maybe for four and I love to create a uh, spread. So this would be maybe served with a, with some grain, like a, you know, like a hearty rice dish, and maybe some sautéed greens of some description. Uh, yeah, that's the that's the way it's done. I'm going to sit down, oh, yeah. and we'll smoothly trans move on to the <laughs> conversation. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. It's like the old cooking shows where someone would produce something from an oven that they made earlier. You know. Yeah, here's but, the the, but I haven't. But, we, but you haven't got that. <laughs> but I haven't done that. You haven't done that. Look, I'm, I'm, I want to ask you really quickly about the pickled celery. It, it just needs. It only took an hour. I, I think of pickling as something that takes a really long time. Yeah, it it's a good point. So this this book is full of what we call quick pickles. Uh, so we take very. It all depends on how thick the vegetable is so okay so things that are quite hefty obviously it takes much longer for the brine or the vinegar to penetrate and pickle but if you slice something very thinly uh, like an onion or or celery root or 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 chili uh, and put vinegar and salt or it depends on the profile flavor that you want or vinegar and sugar uh, it starts pickling quite quickly and it removes the harshness from the, for, let's say it's an onion, uh, quite quickly. So red onion is a kind of the perfect vehicle for quick pickling and it just uh, adds such beautiful color. And so we do that quite often in the book where something looks a little bit, you know, brown. Uh, we finish it off with quickly pickled red onion and all of a sudden it shines, you know, <laughs> that's, the kind of, that's the power of the red onion. Uh, as one one option. I mean, there's a lot of other options in the in that department. So you you've divided the book up into three sections. Can you talk talk us through the three the three P's? Yeah, the three P's. So the book is it, first of all. I want to say that this structure of the book came about after the book after the recipes have been uh, assembled, and it's quite important to say that. So. The book is not a result of some kind of theoretical dis discussions that we've had about how the book should be structured. It's really a collection of our favorite vegetable or, or um, you know, vegetable grains, vegetable uh, dishes, uh, legumes. But in, in a way, once we've had all the recipes that we love, we started breaking them down into chapters, um, Easter and I. And we realized that the chapter headings just didn't make any sense. You know, one chapter was about... Uh, acidity and another was one was about mushrooms and uh, the other one was about charring and these are just things from completely different categories of in the kitchen you know one is about flavor the other was an ingredient and then we took our friend and colleague Tara Wigley uh, one light bulb moment where she looked at what we've done she said actually there's there's a, there's actually some kind of rationale to that madness because in a sense you've got three types of chapters the ones of them one of them is about the pro produce 
Uh, the other one is about process, and the third one is about pairing. And the ones about, you know, process is quite easy to understand. It's, you know, it's things that happen when you cook. It's, it's, it's browning and charring, it's aging, you know, things that happen and we are familiar with. So what I did with that celeriac, I stuck it in the oven and it's got fancy, way, there are fancy way to describe it, the Maillard, uh, you know, uh, phenomenon where, you know, where things uh, turn brown as they cook and that's what we love about flavor. But in actual fact, it's, it's, very, it's a very intuitive thing that people who cook understand what happens when things are browned and when uh, starches converts into sugar and things just become more delicious. Uh, so that is the, uh, that's the process and there's other processes that we talk about. And then there's the pairing, which is, you know, sometimes a dish is all about a particular flavor profile that, that you pair the vegetable with. Like some things just work so well with different layers of acidity. So acidity is a pairing. Uh, sometimes sugar or sweetness are a particular uh, prevalent uh, way of describing a dish. And so every vegetable dish has had its own either pairing or process or produce to make it as, as good as it is. In the produce, we've got like these incredible chapters that are all about particular things that we, we know and love, like mushrooms. You know, mushrooms are, have a chapter to themselves because they've, they're so full of flavor. We call it umami or you, call it, you, can, you can call it, you know, savoriness or whatever you want to call it. But it is an incredible ability. And there's a recipe for mushroom lasagna which Easter created, which is pretty incredible. It's like it's, be, it's made such an impact because, um, because it's got four types of mushroom, two types of dried mushroom and lots of fresh mushrooms. When you eat it, it's just such a rich, wonderfully rich experience. You just don't want to eat anything else apart from it. And that's what the, work, the book is all about. It's about these layers, layers of mushrooms or layers of acidity, which may give uh, vegetable uh, dishes their, their character, their, their personality. The mushrooms are a really great meat substitute. I mean, I, I know there's mo all, all the recipes are vegetarian, most are vegan or can be veganized. Um, yeah. But um, so I, I wanted to talk to you about meat substitutes that have become so popular and just particularly in the last two years, the Beyond yeah. Meat and the Impossible Meat. What are your thoughts or feelings about that? I'm just going to say that not all the recipes are strictly vegetarian. Uh, the, uh, some recipes are have some, not many of them but some of them would have anchovies or okay. fish sauce and we highlight that and offer substitutes uh, i think 95 percent are, are vegetarian uh to let's say to parmesan eaters and then another 85 percent are strictly vegetarian and then about 50 or 60 percent are vegan but um but and that's quite important for me to draw this distinction because mm -hmm. i think we i don't love the labels so i'd rather just write a book about vegetables that mm -hmm. people can adapt to their own choices but um going back to meat substitutes um i understand where this comes from uh i'm never going to be a massive fan of this because i love meat but i also love, i love vegetables equally and i think i can live without it uh if i need to because there's so much going on in the world of vegetables that i'd rather eat um top standard vegetable than a substandard meat if you see what I mean. Um, but I also appreciate that the, for a lot of people, that's a real you know, meat lovers that maybe haven't seen the light when it comes to, to vegetables, that idea of uh, having something that is just as good as a burger or a steak and, and comes, up, comes about in a, in a more sustainable way or without a, you know, uh, the ecological impact that these things have. Um, I... I respect that, but it's just not my world. You know, I'm not drawn to it personally. Mm -hmm. I, I'm with you. I, I would rather eat a big mushroom sandwich than a fake burger. Yeah, that's doesn't, yeah. Doesn't <laughs> do it you, we might be we might be surprised one day. We might. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit more about the book and uh, the the home cook and how the home cook can approach the book. What what do you feel for someone like me who's more tentative? I like you know um, can be off put by long lists of ingredients. Off put put off. Um, but <laughs> um, and yet it feels very accessible. What what do yes. you what do you so, recommend for the tentative cook? For the tentative cook, well, there's a lot of uh, recipes that are uh, really 
very doable and easy for um, you know for a quick dinner, and uh, they but they're equally interesting and complex. Uh, like we've Easter and I have been cooking quite often a orecchiette dish, uh, which is a kind of orecchiette puttanesca but with a North African uh, touch because we added some caraway se seeds and tomato paste, and uh, which are very typical to North African cooking, there's kind of flavor combination, but we still have capers and olives and tomatoes in there. And, and it's, um, it's, it's something that you can do uh, in one pan in 20 minutes. And it's just a wonderful thing to eat. Oh, and it's got chickpeas in it's fried chickpeas. So the chickpeas, some of the chickpeas are cooked, but they can come from a can. You don't need to cook them yourself. Come of, some of them are cooked, um, uh, just quickly fried before and left for garnish and some are cooked slowly with a pasta and the lovely thing about that dish is uh, that you don't have to pre-boil your dry pasta your pasta you just throw it in the orchette they absorb the, the the sauce and they give it body because the starch just stays in the pan rather than drain away with the pasta water like normally ha happens when you make pasta and so you have this lovely thick delicious dish with capers and olives and tomatoes and chickpeas and it's something that you can throw together in quite a quite a short amount of time so that would be the one for you okay thank you I'll make a note and the <laughs> and then for your, the the hardcore Ottolenghi fans who will cook their way through all your books from yeah. page page one to 200 <laughs> um what, what's the what's the piece de resistance what's the the, the dish in this book that okay so they should try that's a good question uh, so there's a couple of dishes. So I think the lasagna that I mentioned uh, is very compelling for people who are willing to spend a little bit of time chopping mushrooms, although you can do them all in the food processor, so it's not. But creating the layers and all that, that's a bit of work. Um, another dish which is incredibly easy to make and is quite magical is the miso butter onions. It's my only recipe, I think, so far that's got only three ingredients, butter uh, uh, onions and miso <laughs> and uh, and it's a it's a it's a kind of a magical thing because you, all you need to do is throw those onions with some water miso and butter into the into a pan and cook them according to the instructions and the the sauce around the onions uh, just turns into wonderfully brown delicious buttery gravy uh, the only thing that I have to say about this, the, the, the time saved by gathering, by not gathering a long list of ingredients, you need to spend by getting the right size pan, because um, because this recipe is, a, is about the degree of evaporation of the water in the during the cooking that just needs to work out to create that sauce. So one of the things that people sometimes raise their eyebrows when it comes to my cooking, when I say, oh, I'll do it in a 30 by 40 centimeters or however that is in inches a pan. And they go like, do I really need to know that? <laughs> and I often say, actually it's quite crucial because you want something to roast or to stew, but you don't want them to happen at the same time and for the, all the wrong reasons. So these onions are a great example of, of, of the size of the pan being really crucial for getting the results that you want with those onions. Uh, Ista plays a big part in the book. I mean, she is obviously a, a um, really important part of your team. Can you talk a little bit about yeah. how you work together as a team? Yeah, I love talking about Ista. So, you know, she's my co-author on the book and she's the one who really put the book together and, and collected so many of the recipes and cr created them. And uh, she's, she's um, 28 and she really hasn't had a traditional background in food. A bit like myself, she came to it as, as a second or third career. Uh, but just like me, she's a really, she's a very greedy eater and has always been interested in food. And she's got an incredible talent, but also a really interesting background. She grew up in, in Italy. Uh, she had family in Mexico and Brazil. So she visited those countries quite a lot growing up. And she's really, uh, absorbed all the culinary cultures that she's come into contact with and she and also she's a really good with Asian ingredients with Chinese ingredients so she puts together things can you hear the train that's our train uh, <laughs> um, so she puts together combinations that are pretty incredible 
Mm. Like we've got like a, a fusion caponata, which is, you know, caponata is a Sicilian dish made with eggplants and capers. It's a sweet and sour, beautiful thing. And she added um, Shaoxing wine and soy sauce to it mm. and, and uh, silken tofu. Uh, so if the Italians would have that with ricotta, she substituted one, the bland Italian ingredient to a bland Asian ingredient, which are, they're bland in the best possible way because they really take on flavor so lovely, so, so wonderfully. And uh, so she does those things and I, I love working with her because she always comes up with all these uh, incredible ideas. And she's joined the Test Kitchen about four years ago and about two years ago, I asked her if she wanted to work on this book. And she did, and uh, as as I said, she did a, a marvelous job at at doing that. And um, and I love collaborating. I, I try all my all my books, or nearly all my books are collaborations. And I always feel that I I'm it's a kind of a win win situation because I learn lots of new things. The reader get a whole new perspective. I, I guess it's from the Ottolenghi angle, but it's a different perspective because another person um, brings their own private culinary experiences into this and uh, and something completely new comes out so i i, I think it, it really works for me this this way of working do, do you have kind of robust debates at the end of you know if you're if you're working on a recipe together are there moments when you d firmly disagree or are uh, you usually surpri su surprisingly this hardly ever happens and i i find that it's quite an interesting thing i find uh, that I, for me, that's a proof that human palate is a very particular thing. And we, we always tend to, dis to agree when something hits the spot. I think mm -hmm. we have very little arguments. Oh, I don't like that. Or I do. And I guess we all have a similar point of view and we, and we have uh, maybe similar cultural her heritages. But, but in some basic way, we really tend to to agree on on what's what's right and what's wrong, and there's very little disagreement. I, I find, uh, and I, I always I always think about it as something quite uh, interesting because you know you always think you know food is personal. You know some people love this, some people don't like that, but I think it's less personal than we tend to think. I think that there is a real commonality around food, and when something is well prepared and is balanced in terms of textures. Um, acidity versus sweetness versus the fatty elements in it, uh, then someone who's, who enjoys food would be able to say that, to tell you that. And, and I don't think there's a lot of room for, for disagreement. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, yeah, that's, yeah, that's an interesting... I, I, um, I, I wanted to talk about palate and taste and intense flavors. I, I, I had COVID in March and lost my sense of taste. It was one of the weirdest experiences ever. Um, and so um, it's interesting that you say we do all have similar palates. I, I was frantically adding red onions to things to see if I could taste <laughs> anything I... at all. It was a very yeah. biz bizarre experience. Did you um, get it back? Yes, I did. Oh. And I was very oh. grateful to you have it back. Be, yeah. yeah, Very grateful. Yeah. Um, but how has your, you know, how the, the pandemic has been, um, has disrupted everything, obviously. Um, how has your experience of the last eight months been and uh, both personally and uh, what have you been cooking and, and how are your yeah. restaurants? So I also had COVID and I also lost my taste buds. <gasps> uh, yeah, also in March. So I guess we were part of the same, you know, initial group. Um, <laughs> but I didn't know. I have at the very early stages, they didn't talk about it losing taste so, so much. So I just knew that I couldn't taste anything. And I just thought it's because, you know, I had a stuffy nose and, you know, I had to cook some kind of things that felt like cold symptoms. So I thought like, that's why I was, I couldn't smell or taste anything. And only in hindsight, once I started really understanding that that's the, the, the symptom, I, um, I, and I also got it back, luckily. It wouldn't have been good if I'd lost it forever. <laughs> uh, and it's been a it's been a very complicated uh, exp experience the last few months for you months for me, uh, like for everyone else. Um, in terms of the restaurants, it's been very difficult to shut down restaurants and uh, to shut down our restaurants was very painful. And it's I don't know that it felt like it felt like you know like, you know, um, 
anesthetizing some someone, you know, like a person, you know, it felt like you're putting them under, but you're not a hundred percent sure if they're going to come back, you know, that kind of feeling that I had. And, and I couldn't really be part of it so much because I had to stay at home because I was sick mm -hmm. and I, it was, it was just awful. And, and um, it's still pretty awful, although we reopened our restaurant and um, for the time being, we're allowed to, to serve customers. And it's wonderful to see people back, mm -hmm. uh, even though the numbers are obviously much smaller and the restaurants are kind of half full rather than go to completely full like they were before. Uh, so we're kind of in this limbo state now where we're kind of expecting to look to, to might have to shut down again and who knows when and it's 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 very difficult it's very di it's difficult for everybody and for and, but for different reasons you know for me uh, as as you know co-owner of the business for staff their future i mean it's it's just there's no winners in in this uh pandemic that's that's the that's the awful thing about it mm -hmm. um the good thing that happened to me is that i was stuck at home for three months with my uh, or two, two, two plus months with my, my husband and our two boys. And we really actually had a really good time uh, because there was no distractions. You know, we could just be, do things. And it, was, it had a completely different quality from normal life because, you know, at home, even if you go on holiday or on weekends, there's always stuff to do. And all of a sudden there was nothing to do. <laughs> it was, it's bizarre. It's really weird when there's nothing to do. And some some you know wonderful things come out of that you know we we went on <clears throat> you know country walks for hours and just sat there and looked at bugs and butterflies and and plants and and i think it, this was something that we just never ever do we never take mm -hmm. the time to do that and i have these really vivid memories that i'm sure i'm going to carry me, with me forever and the kids will as well of just spending three hours doing absolutely nothing in the middle of a field with a frisbee you know that's just the, <laughs> that's just the the quality of, of, of uh, time that we got. So, you know, you weigh those things against each other. And, and I guess like with everything, there's, you know, positive side, but all in all, it, it's, it's bad. And it's, it's bad because it, I think it just sheds this horrible cloud over our future and who knows, that's what I'm worried about. Yeah. What, what, when your taste came back, what were the kind of comfort foods that you longed for? Yeah, so I mean, I still up until uh, a couple of months ago, I really missed my weekends going to Chinatown for you know for good dim sum and you know all manner of Asian dumplings because it's not something I make myself, uh, so I, I felt really deprived from that. And it's funny, it's a kind of a cultural thing. I think even though I might cook something Chinese, I don't think I'll ever cook it as good as when I go to Chinatown and have mm -hmm. those noodles or have those. Um, you know, turnip cakes or whatever it is that I'm, I decide to, to order. Um, but we, we cooked a lot of those kind of things at home. Again, it was very much the palate has to, to because you cook three meals a day to, to your family. I mean, not, I, Carl did even more cooking than I did, uh, but the boys just demanded their kind of food. So there was a lot of pasta and fritters and, uh, and, and potato dishes and and I was I was becoming quite creative in that department because you know I wanted them to eat the food and enjoy it. So I made, uh, you know, things that um, like slow like the pasta that I described to you that's cooked in one pan. I made a lot of those where I I got everything that I could and then I'd add pasta and cook it very slowly and you get that very special quality of something that's kind of slow cooked and all the starches uh, uh, um, absorb the liquids. I made. There's a recipe for a cauliflower fritter, which uh, Sami Tamimi, uh, my business partner, uh, uh, had when he was a child in Jerusalem, and it's in our first cookbook. And it's a very simple recipe to cook. It's got cauliflower and turmeric and cumin and um, some coriander and egg and cinnamon. Cinnamon is key. Mm -hmm. And you fry them and you can just have it then and there and you can have it the next day in a sandwich or when you go on a picnic, it was a wonderful thing. And we had loads of those. Yeah. Nice, comforting, starchy food. Mm -hmm. So um, we're in San Francisco and you're in London and I know you come here a lot. You Did, did you live here for a while? Did you, did 
you I live lived in... in San Francisco when I was seven or eight oh. uh, for one year in in, in, oh. in Mill Valley in the Bay yeah. Area. In, in the Bay Area, but, um, yeah. but you know you have a huge um, uh, following here, and I know you uh, come quite frequently. What do you like to do and eat in San Francisco? Oh well, you know I like to. What do I like to go and eat? I, I used to, I was. Fisherman's Wharf was somewhere where I used to go a lot when I was when I was a kid. When we used to get, you know, when I was growing up in in Israel, there was not much seafood and definitely not all the prawns and shrimp and shrimps and uh, so that was one thing that whenever we came that I had I had to go there. Um, and there's so many good so many uh, good restaurants that I go to over and over, you know I go back and 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 enjoy Nopa. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't been there for a long time. Uh, in the Mission, uh, the restaurants around there, I go to Tartine for the bread. And it's just, I, I miss so much of the stuff. And I haven't been for like at least, I was, I'm going to say, yeah, two years uh, or a year and a half. And it just feels such a long time. Yeah. <laughs> That, I mean, you, you travel a lot. You must miss, I mean, and not just San Francisco. You must miss that. You, um ability just to get on a plane and go somewhere yes and no I, I miss that uh, but I also miss um, I also I'm quite happy to travel less mm. uh, so you know I, I miss traveling yeah I miss traveling but I'm also I really I really enjoy at the moment just being here and and traveling a little bit less so this is a kind of a mix a mixture of uh, resp responses it's, it's <laughs> nice to be at home um, well, we have some uh, questions coming in from the audience, so I will um, read them out. Here's one. Uh, it says, so many of your recipes combine ingredients and profiles into unexpectedly extraordinary flavors. How do you recommend home cooks develop a knowledge and personal flavor profile? Well, yeah, it's a really good question. I, I think... Um, there is something about the actual act of cooking that is really important in this. And it sounds trivial because, you know, obviously you need to cook. To, but some people don't understand the importance of repetition. Uh, I think Nigella Lawson has a cookbook now. I think it's called Cook, Eat, Repeat, if I'm not mistaken. But the word, the word repeat is in the title. And I, she's, she's a friend of mine, and she often, when we have a conversation, she talks about the skill of cooking, which is a result of repetition. It's a, it's a, it's a competence uh, that you, you develop through, through uh, repetition. And I think for someone to develop um, their particular style or their flavor, flavor profile, I think they need to try to know a cuisine. And to know a cuisine or, or a regional um, way of cooking, you just need to to cook it, and I, I think the one thing that is really important, and I often say that when I'm asked the question, is to actually um, try to not um, move around too much from one cuisine to the to another. Because I think sometimes I think people look at food as like a, a competitive sport. You know, I'm, I'm, I'll be really good at that, and then I might try another thing. And in a way, it's a, it's much more about comfort and ease, and or at least that's what it should be about. So I think, uh, let's say you've introduced yourself to Middle Eastern ingredients, stay there for a couple of years, you know, try to cook more Middle Eastern food with ingredients that, you, um, that you've uh, purchased and become familiar with before you move to Vietnamese, let's say. I, I just mm -hmm. think there's something to be said about just kind of enjoying the, the, uh, everything that a, a cuisine has to offer. And I firmly believe that rather than... Uh, cook to impress you should cook for joy and that that mm. would create that would just give you what you need mm. that's a great phrase cook cook <laughs> rather than cook to impress cook for joy i like that um okay here is another question i always think really good writers strongly have their own voice do chefs have their own voice and if so which chefs or cooks do you admire or have have influenced you um so I, I think chefs can have a voice, but they don't have to have a voice. I think it's not a, it's not a, I think chefs should not, should know how to cook. And that's the number one requirement. And, and I think it's, it's, it's the only thing that really matters. And whether they can talk about it or not is, 
is is um, is a is a different matter. Uh, so uh, no, I don't think it's essential. I think if you want to tell your story, it's quite good to be able to verbalize it in a particular way. But I know so many amazing chefs that are not the best speakers, or they don't, but they just cook really really well, and you know they put these incredible uh, um, uh, meals on the table, and that's just what it is about. Um, I mentioned Nigella earlier because I really love her writing and there's, a, there's mm -hmm. some people who have the talent to do both things, which is great. So then you get something really special, a cookbook with some inspirational writing. And she is one of those people and I love her books. As soon as I get one, I read it cover to cover because mm -hmm. she's got so much to tell and she tells it in such a nice way. Uh, but but it's not, it's not, a, it's not a essential. Do you enjoy the writing process yourself? I love writing, but I write quite, it, it comes, it, I love having written rather than the process. So I love it. I love to be at the end of it because it comes quite painfully to me. And, and but I, I, I'm happy with what I do, uh, but I don't, uh, and I don't do all the writing, all the writing in my book. So um, in, uh, for instance, in Jerusalem, I did all the writing, but in this book, we had help from Tara Wigley. I mentioned her mm -hmm. before when, it, uh, when, when she looked at, she came up with the 3P concept and she really helped uh, putting our thoughts in order, but also with the writing. So I would have wanted to write more and I would have wanted to write all of it, but I, I write so slowly. I write like a paragraph in like two hours that it was just not be feasible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, next question. Uh, which cuisine are you most excited with in the moment? Um, well, I, I really uh, love, I, I, I kind of like, because I love food so much, I can really be excited, get excited about, about any cuisine, I think. I haven't kind of come across a, a place which, where I just say that. But maybe I, I haven't been all over the world. I've been to a few countries, but not to all of them. So, uh, so I, I don't know. But I love... Um, the cuisine of Turkey. Uh, I think that's a country with incredible culinary history. And, um, and in this book, we have a couple of recipes that are is, uh, inspired by the province of Xi'an in China. Mm -hmm. I haven't been there, but there's a few res restaurants in London that serve the food of Xi'an. And, uh, and I just love what I've, what I've tasted. And a couple of recipes are, as I mentioned, are inspired by those flavors, you know, the chilies uh, mostly and the sharp and sweet aspects in the cooking. And I just love, I love those flavors, but I can get excited about every cuisine. I think, uh, I think Palestinian cuisine is incredible. That's a, that's a cuisine that I've grown up with uh, in Jerusalem and it's getting a real renaissance now. Um, Sami Tamimi, whom I mentioned, who is a partner in this company, has just written a book and I'm not just plugging it. That's a great book. <laughs> it's called Palestine. He wrote it with Tara. And it is, it tells the story of a culture that hasn't been so much in the front line in terms of how it's been as, uh, rep how much it's been represented, but it's a really, really ancient and beautiful and very, um, delicious, uh, uh cuisine or, or a culture, uh, with a, with a great history. Is that out now? Can we find that on the shelves? Yeah, it's in all good bookshops. All good bookshops, <laughs> very good. Um, okay, another question. Uh, this is a good question. Especially during COVID, I find my motivation to cook ebbs and flows more drastically than ever. How do you battle cooking fatigue and what inspires you to get back in the kitchen after a low point? Uh, so if, my answer is that you don't really have to cook, luckily, if, in our world. I mean, I, I, I just think that sometimes um, um, I, um, I, 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 some people think, okay, well, there's something wrong with me if I don't want to cook. And there's so, so many quick ways to put a dinner, on a, a dinner on a table, put dinner on a table without cooking. I, one of the sections in the book that I'm really proud of is our condiment section and essentially what it is, is we take uh, marinades and sauces and, uh, and um, cond different um, components of dishes and tell you, the reader, the cook to 
make double or triple or quadruple when you uh, when you cook the dish. Uh, I'm talking about chili sauces or chili oils, or butters, mayos, things that are just good. Uh, even the stuff I put over the um, the celeriac now, uh, that mixture of soy and vinegar and chilies and garlic, that could easily be something that you put in a jar. And having those jars uh, is, a, is such a quick way to put a meal on the table. You make a, night, a rice or scrambled eggs or noodles or pasta and you take one of those from your shelf and you, and you have a meal on the table, which is quick and easy. And, and it's just something that I think more of us should, um, ad, an attitude more of us should adopt, which, is, which means, you know, you, you make things and you just, you know, use your, those lovely condiments. You don't have to spend two hours in the kitchens if, if you don't feel like it. It's a great joy, but it's not a necessity. And while we're on the subject of Palestine, Steph here brought this book so I can just show you. <laughs> lovely. <laughs> and that's the, that's... Um, that's the book. Excellent. Um, okay, here's another question. Um, what is your go-to dish when I, and this is a kind of follow on, I suppose. What's your go-to mm -hmm. dish when you're cooking for yourself? And what are your go-to ingredients, things that you always have on hand and that are the most versatile? Yeah. Uh, so it's a, it, it's a good, yeah, it's a follow on from the other, on the other, from the other uh, question. And I guess uh, often, uh, I I love cooking and my kids love that too to make rice dishes. It's quick and easy, and the rice is just such a great vehicle for absorption of, of flavors. So I do a lot of uh, one one tray uh, rice that's baked in the oven. I do that very often, where I take uh, maybe whole tomatoes and garlic cloves and cook them a bit in oil, throw that into the bottom of the pan, put a layer of basmati rice or a, any long grain rice. And sorry, I add stock and cover it and put it straight into the oven. And mm. after half an hour, you've got an incredible meal, which is, you know, which just kind of almost cooked itself. That's that's something I, I often do. Once you know the rat ratio of water to to or stock to rice, uh, you can just play. You can put mushrooms there, or you can put little beetroots there, or you can put a combination of those, or you know, and then the rice goes on top and and you're and you're ready to go. So that's, that's something I could, I could, um, I could eat in any day or in every day. And the kind of the, the storeroom staples, what's in your, oh, yeah. in, in, in the, the larder. <laughs> uh, my larder has, um, I guess it depends on what book I'm writing, right? So at the moment, my larder is full of, so flavor has a lot of dried chilies in it. And um, uh, mostly, and, you know, chipotle chilies and cascabel chilies and ancho chilies. And that's just because in this book, there's quite a few recipes that have chilies. Not all the recipes, not even half the recipes, but we love what both Issa and I, what those chilies uh, bring to the table. And it's not necessarily heat. Mm -hmm. uh, often um, there's this kind of misconception, maybe not in California, but in other parts of the world, that uh, chilies are kind of a vehicle for heat. But actually... Some of them are not very hot at all, and they're just wonderfully uh, sweet or or uh, kind of um, coffee-like or, or chocolatey-like in flavor or a bit more anisey. And you really bring those incredible layers of flavor uh, to the to the um, to the table. And I think for me, creating layers of flavor, as I said before, you know, through uh, through a combination of ingredients that are not totally dissimilar from each other, like using a dried chili and a fresh chili makes the most interesting dishes because you kind of get a real multi-layer sens and multi multi-layer mm. sensory experience. Mm. If you have two types of dried chili and one fresh chili, you really taste those all those things in your in your plate. We've got an amazing recipe for roasted cauliflower, and so I've I've published so many recipes for roasted cauliflower, but here you go. There's another one. And this one's got uh, chili butter, uh, butter and fresh chilies and dried chilies and harissa, uh, Tunisian North, uh, Tunisian uh, chili paste. And the result is just so incredibly uh, complex. It's just, mm. it's just wonderful. Cauliflower is another good meat substitute, isn't it? If you have a kind of yeah. cauliflower steak. It's, it's really meaty. 
and and like but all of my it's like so many vegetables that I love so much it really does um it's it's really very flexible and versatile in the way that it can work in so many contexts you know and also so many cooking techniques mm-hmm. you know you can roast it or you can eat it raw or you can steam it or you can um grill it and there's just it's just like endless option humble cauliflower okay um next question Okay, here we go. There have been numerous studies and reports in recent years about how collective diets will need to change to account for agricultural shifts and climate change. The principles are basic, eat sustainably, eat less meat and dairy, eat more grains and vegetables, but I found it difficult to inspire others to shift away from the more old school Western diet. Aside from cooking the most incredible vegetable centric dishes, how do you help others make this shift? Very important question. Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think the the answer was the in the aside from, because I think um, it's for me, and I, I really find it quite difficult to convince people to do the right thing. Uh, because I, I think there is a certain degree of antagonism that comes through when you when you try to um, in a kind of a, obviously we all know it's the right thing to eat less meat and focus on a vegetable-based diet, but it's not always easy to take that sh- shift or to make that change. And I think uh, it's it's extremely important to show what there is and how it can be done. And I and I I'm, I know of so many people through uh, the knowledge of how to cook vegetables have really shifted the balance in their diet. It wasn't a kind of a mm. cold turkey, excuse the pun, moment where you uh, when you uh, you leave one way of eating behind and embark on a new. That's just hardly ever happens. Mm-hmm. I think the gradual changes are just more, much more sustainable and longer lasting. And and the idea that you introduce uh, more delicious vegetable dishes into your home cooking over a long a period of time, uh, and that will last, is is a much more realistic way to look at to look at it because it. It, it just as, as I said, it, it doesn't matter how much you're going to say it, unless people will actually enjoy eating vegetables, uh, they won't come round. And, and and that's what I've always said. I've said right, the books are there. I can go talk about it forever about how good these things are, uh, and then now you know go and try it, and I'm sure you'll be convinced that you can have way more meatless meals in your life. Uh, if you try those 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 dishes. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, many here we go. Many of your recipes call for red chili, and I never know which type of red chili I should use. Is there a standard type of red chili you recommend for your recipes that don't specify type? And when you call for crushed garlic, is it crushed in a garlic crusher or mashed with a knife? Oh, these are two amazing exper- uh, questions that really um, tell the story of uh, the difference we of, in terms between the and, and ingredients between the UK and the mm-hmm. United States. So, first about the chilies. So, in British supermarkets, you can get a red chili without a specification of type, and it's a medium heat red chili. And it's a kind of, you can get more specific if you want, but the, the red chilies that we get here often is with a, leg, with, a type, with a label red chili are medium heat and they're very versatile and they're just perfect for creating something which is, um, which, and they're kind of that long. So it's not the bird's eye and it's not the, um, what you call the smaller ones. Um, I forgot the name now, but anyway, they're, they're very, uh, they're kind of perfectly mild and, and you can, or medium heat, and you can use them across the board. And here we just, because we don't give them a name, we know that they're, they work in all these contexts. So that's, that's the one that you'll be looking at. You should be looking for medium heat. Uh, normally the smaller chilies are just so much uh, more, it's more spicier, like the scotch bonnet or mm-hmm. the bird's eye. But this, this, the moment they start kind of growing and, and so that, that's what you're, you're looking for. And the crushed garlic is something I learned the hard way because in Britain we say crushed garlic, we call what in North America people call minced garlic. Mm-hmm. 
So uh, you take garlic crusher or you do it by knife and you get your garlic minced. And, and I occasionally I had my recipes published in American publications where I called for crushed garlic and then I see a whole garlic clove just bashed with a knife inside a dish where it should have been uh, squeezed out of a garlic crusher or, or with a knife. And, I, and I, I now learned the hard way. When I say crushed garlic, I mean minced garlic for the American audience or crushed garlic for the British audience. And these are just two really good examples of things that are lost in translation, even between two English speaking nations. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, thank you for the translation. Um, okay, how much time on average do you spend preparing family dinner on a weeknight or on the weekend? How much time on average do you spend preparing family? Oh, it's the same question repeated. Um, so how much time do you spend on average preparing family dinner? <laughs> Third time lucky. <laughs> uh, well, um, I do, I, you know, I don't do as much cooking as, as my husband does at home. And I think he spends quite a bit of time. Uh, uh, I would say he spends 45 minutes at least on a family dinner. Uh, but also he does something that we both do quite a lot and that's batch cooking. Mm. So in our house, mostly uh, when you cook, you batch cook. So we've got sauce and it's really, I mean, people imagine that you're super organized and tidy and, and plan ahead and have this kind of, you know, forward thinking mind when you do batch cooking. But all I mean is you make a sauce or you make a stew and you just put it in a little container and stick them in the freezer and then you don't need to do it the next day. And I, I've become a real advocate of this thing. It's a bit like those condiments that I talked about earlier. It's just, it takes you the same amount of time almost to cook double or triple. It's just, yeah, a bit slightly more chopping, but in a way it's, it's makes so much more sense to do that. So we do, I do on the Sunday, often I do batch. And well, that's, I'm not going to talk about that because that's a bit too chefy. But anyway, I, <laughs> I, you, you do your sauce, you know, your pasta sauce, a tomato sauce. And I, and I do it often on the weekend. It takes me an hour and a half and I do these containers and they sit in the freezer and they come out so easily. Um, so, yeah, that's the answer. And during the weekend, I would spend much more time cooking because there's just more time to spend. So then. I might make a cake for after dinner, and but that's that's when you have the time to to spend in the kitchen, which is lovely. And during lockdown, obviously, when people are stuck at home, obviously you can spend a lot of time cooking because you've got nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. Highly yeah. recommended. <laughs> but it, I miss dinner parties. Do you miss dinner parties? I do miss dinner parties. I miss just being with people. I miss sitting on the bar in a restaurant with a good friend and you know hugging and just like you know rubbing shoulders and elbows with lots of other people i really miss that mm -hmm. i miss that we still we can still have dinner parties here for up to six so uh so i i have hosted one actually only a couple of days ago which was quite quite nice good memory of of the old days so that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay i think we've got time for a couple more questions and um how, how much time on average no we've done that one um <laughs> Okay, here's a question from the UK. Um, what do you think people mean when they say a dish is very otolenghi? How does that make you feel? With so many parents at home with their kids, do you have tips to help parents get their kids to cook with them? Okay, so two questions in one. Yeah. So what does it mean to be an otolenghi dish? Yeah, it's something that I've learned the hard way. So sometimes we cook something here in the test kitchen, which is where I am and a lot, you know, most of the um, experiments is done here and often we come come uh, up with something which is good but it's just not otolenghi enough and we tell that to ourselves you know it sounds a bit um, ironic uh, but it is really true that there is a sort of a set of expectations when it comes to an otolenghi dish and um, it, I guess what it means is that it needs uh, it needs a kind of uh, there needs to be some kind of a curveball, I think. There needs to be an element of surprise or something slightly unusual going on uh, when it comes to an Otolenghi dish. It just can't be... Uh, in, in the UK, we have Nigel Slater for that, right? Like, we have people who write more traditional recipes mm -hmm. that are really, really good and are, you know, that are solid. 
but from an hotelengi dish, there's always this expectation of some firework or something a little bit different and unusual happening, the sweet and the sour, and there's something about the presentation that there needs to be quite a lot of contrast in the dish, color-wise, flavor-wise, that all these things are what people have come to expect. And often I want to put something on the menu, and the only thing that stops me from doing that is because it's not hotelengi enough, which sounds really bizarre, but it's just, it's just uh, the way it is. So, yeah, I think those are the, that's my observation. Um, with regards to cooking with children, I think it really depends what age they are, because I just find this as a romantic notion doesn't really work most of the time. Because um, I tried so many, so many times in the past to get my, well, they've asked, you know, like, let's bake a cake. But what happens in the end is that they walk in, they maybe crack an egg and then they find something more exciting to do and then you're left with with the cooking and the washing up so i think there's a there is a something a notion that but i don't know what happens when they're 11 or 12 i'm sure it gets better but mine are still seven and five so uh, i often say oh let's cook something together but actually i know that means that they're gonna i'm gonna cook and they're gonna watch for as long as they can master their patience and then they're gonna move on <laughs> I like that. It's got pra practical, <laughs> pragmatic. Um, um, okay, so I think this was probably time for our, our last question. Um, how long do you know? Um, where do you anticipate food culture in the UK and or the USA going in the next two to three years? What's what's there, next? That's a great yeah. question to end. Where is it? Where are we going? It's a really good question. Well, I think it's hard because. Um, COVID has just thrown it in a whole new perspective of everything because everything that has started to shift in a way stopped. Mm -hmm. Well, some things have stopped and some things accelerated. So the whole notion of people having food delivered to their door has obviously boomed to beyond what anyone who had expected. And then you've got, you have the whole range of options from cooked to semi-cooked to raw to, uh, so we, we all know how these things work now. Uh, so I think that's kind of here to stay, but you know, certain things have become really important, like those getting raw ingredients, uh, you know, delivered to your door in just the right quantity of the, it's, I mean, in a less wasteful way than it used to be. Although there's more waste on packaging, so it's a kind of a, it's a tricky uh, situation. So that's definitely here to stay. The whole notion of delivery. Um, I think the vegetable cooking is definitely where we're all heading because it's just it's just the way things are and what else is happening in terms of the way people eat i i, I feel that um the old ready meal is is past its sell-by date mm -hmm. uh now so because i just find it people around me at least but i think I've, it's it represents a, a larger chunk of the population I kind of fed up with all those ingredients that are stuffed into those meals. You know, the, the old school ready-made supermarket meals, when you open, the, when you look at the packaging, there's just so much sugar and, sh and mm -hmm. so much, so many ingredients you can't pronounce. Uh, it's just wrong. Mm -hmm. So I think we, I don't know if people are going to cook from scratch so much, but they will definitely be, there's definitely already, uh, at least I see it here, uh, a demand for things that, are good and honest and solid and you understand where they come from and what they mean. So yeah, that's definitely what here to stay. Well, I thank you again so much. I'm going to, these are the, the here's the, this is the American edition, everyone different. Oh, look, you have it too. Here's the English for the bilinguals among us. And um, <laughs> uh, it's a delight. Thank you so much for, for sharing your time in the test kitchen and, I'm still a little bit upset that I can't taste the celery root dish, but I will go home and try it. Um, <laughs> thank and, you, Isabel. And thank you to our audience and thank you uh, to City Arts and Lectures. And um, we hope to see you back here in San Francisco soon. Yeah, I hope to be back soon. And everybody go cook, enjoy the flavors around you. And, uh, and yeah, it was fantastic to be in San Francisco again, <laughs> if not in body, at least in spirit. <laughs> thank you thank you Yotam it's a pleasure